This is a presentation of Northeast Streaming Sports. It just might be the greatest sports franchise in the history of sports. A place where legends are made and there's always something to talk about. Get ready to immerse yourself in pinstripes. Start spreading the news. Hosted by Paul Semendinger and E.J. Fagan. A couple of doctors with a prescription for Yankee fever. And now, here's Dr. Paul Semendinger and Dr. E.J. Fagan. Get ready to start spreading the news. And hello, everyone. Welcome to Monday night. This is the Start Spreading the News Yankees podcast. I am Dr. Paul Semendinger, and Dr. E.J. Fagan is on vacation. So you just have me this evening, but you don't have me live. You have me recorded. I'm pre-recording this week's show because I'm actually live at this moment. It may have ended, but I'm actually live right about this moment at the Wyckoff Public Library talking about my newest book, 365.2, Going the Distance, A Runner's Journey. Now, this program is brought to you by... Artemisia Publishing. Start spreading the news, of course, brought to you by Artemisia, a small independent publisher that has been creating quality books from quality authors. The world is filled with amazing stories, and Artemisia has been on the cusp of the indie publishing scene with their award winning books for over 20 years years. The titles will inform and educate as they entertain you. Are you looking for a little bit of happily ever after? Maybe you'd like some magical realms to explore, or superheroes to save the day, or the world, or the galaxy. There are heart-pumping thrillers to keep you reading just one more page before you go to sleep. Whodunits that keep you guessing. And of course, a number of baseball titles to fill those moments in between the innings or the games themselves. Artemisia also has a collection of books for young readers, transporting them to faraway places to experience history animals, and life's magic like never before. So check out all of their titles at apbooks.net. That's apbooks.net to find your next reading adventure. As I told you, this evening I was at, or I'm at, the Wyckoff Public Library talking about this wonderful book. If you haven't gotten it yet, I suggest you get yourself a copy, 365.2. In the year 2022, I determined that I would run every single day for an entire calendar year. It was a goal I had thought about for many years. It's a goal I fell short of numerous times. And yet, I finally was able to conquer that goal in 2022. And this is the story of how I did it. It's about running. But more, it's about life, and it's about setting goals, and it's about doing things that we never thought possible. You may not want to run every day for a year, but there are things that you would like to do. We all have goals, and really the book is about finding those goals in your life and determining and finding the ways to finally reach those goals. We all fall short, but we all can learn from failure. And I also believe that success begets more success. Once we see what it's like to achieve, we find that we can achieve in ways greater and more wonderful and differently than we ever thought possible. So great stuff. Take a look at that book. I also have a 
author event this Thursday coming up in Montville, New Jersey, in the middle of the day, I believe it's a one o'clock discussion about baseball. And we are going to focus on this wonderful book, also published by Artemisia, The Least Among Them. So let's get to the Yankees. We're a couple of weeks, 10 days or so away from opening day. If you had asked me a couple of weeks ago, are you confident that the Yankees are going to have a really good season? I would have said I have some concerns because I've shared them here. I've shared them on Start Spreading the News. And I've shared them on the Dr. Sem Yankees program, which airs here on the Northeast Streaming Sports Network every Saturday morning at 7 a.m. But within those concerns, there was a lot of hope. And EJ and I have talked about all the things to be hopeful for in 2024. But that was before Garrett Cole was injured. And that was before Aaron Judge was injured. Now, I talked a lot about the Garrett Cole injury on the Dr. Sem show just two days ago, last Saturday. The big point there is he's going to miss about 15 starts at best. When the Yankees were figuring I would hope I would hope that this is what they do. They look at the roster, they look at the pitchers, and they figure Garrett Cole's going to give them 30 or so starts. Well, let's just keep the numbers easy. 30. The Yankees had to figure that they were going to win 20 of those games if Cole was going to have any sort of a typical Garrett Cole season. And they were probably hoping the Yankees would win 22, 23, 24, 25 of those games. That's what you hope for with your ace. Doesn't mean Cole's going to win that many games, but he's going to put the team in the position to win those games, even if he comes out. But if we say two out of three, that's a great percentage. So that's 20 wins. So he's going to lose 15 starts at best. So what's that? 10 wins, nine wins. That's a lot of wins that the Yankees are going to have to find a way to make up. Nobody predicted that the Yankees were going to win the American League East by 10 or eight games. Everybody sees the division as being pretty close. So if you lose your ace, you've got to figure out a way to get those other wins. And the Yankees right now, and I'm recording this on Sunday night, right now it looks like they're going to try an untested rookie as that pitcher who's going to make up those 15 starts. And that's a tall order for the Yankees to be able to find someone to win all of those games it could be problematic. But we talked about that already, or I did on the Yankees show, the Dr. Sem Yankees show. My concern tonight is to talk a little about Aaron Judge. And then after this, I'd love for us to look at Aaron Judge and Garrett Cole historically and see where they fit historically as we look at baseball reference. And I don't look at stats a lot live while I'm doing a show, but we'll do it tonight. I'm going to break a tradition or a best practice, if you will, as I do this tonight. But Aaron Judge, this is a little more than a week ago at this point, or maybe a week, but not long ago. It was basically last weekend, as I recall, sat out. It might have been last Tuesday because EJ and I did the show and we talked a little about When is he coming back? Probably tomorrow, I think. Anyway, about a week ago, he had some core issues, some concerns about his core. And typical Yankee fashion, they said, no big deal. No, nothing to look at here. It's all good. Nothing. No, no, no. He came out of a game a little early, but that was nothing. Then he misses a game. Nope, it was a typical day off. And as they're saying this, he's going for an MRI. So the Yankees, again, not being honest. And the MRI came back clean, and the word was he'll be back in the lineup very soon, maybe tomorrow, if not the next day. 
he's still not back on the lineup. Unfortunately, this is the Yankees' way of operating. Either they're not being honest or they have no clue. Either of which is a terrible look. If the Yankees can't be honest, they shouldn't say anything. And if the Yankees have no clue, they shouldn't say anything. But to put out information time and time and time again that gets proven false and wrong, again, makes them look like they don't know what they're saying or doing, or it makes them look like they can't be honest. And either of those is a bad look. But I'm concerned because... We were told it wasn't a big deal. We were told he was going to get back in the lineup, and he still isn't. And opening day, as I look down, is right around the corner. The Yankees aren't just counting on Aaron Judge to be a great player, as he is, of course. They're counting on Aaron Judge To be their center fielder, not just their right fielder where he's great. They're now thinking he's going to be their everyday center fielder. Now, I've been saying since the Yankees got Juan Soto that Aaron Judge should not be the center fielder. I've been, or I was at least, saying get Cody Bellinger. He can play center. He can play first. He can make it easier if Anthony Rizzo doesn't come back to have a quality first baseman. He's one more great bat in the middle of the lineup. He would make players like Alex Verdugo or Trent Grisham or Everson Pereira expendable in a trade to get another pitcher, which I said they needed at the time. Could you imagine if the Yankees had followed this advice and were able to trade some of these extra outfielders for a guy like Corbin Burns or Dylan Cease, then you wouldn't be having a rookie pitch those that fifth spot in the rotation. That game every fifth day, you'd have a proven major league pitcher. But the thing that I'm worried about Judge with is he's not a center fielder. Yes, he did it one year when he hit all those home runs, but otherwise he's a right fielder. And if we have time, we're going to talk a little about Stratomatic Baseball. The new cards from last year just came out. And I'd love to go through some of them and just share with you the way Stratomatic looks at these players. Might be a little bit of fun. But Aaron Judge, my worry. And a lot of people disagreed with me about a lot of this on Start Spreading the News. But I keep saying that Aaron Judge is too valuable of a player to put in center field. He's not young. He's 32. Usually as center fielders, longtime center fielders, reach their early or late 30s or mid 30s, they start moving them off of center field, right? And he's still in his early 30s at 32, but he's at the age when people start saying, well, you know, he's starting to lose a step. We'll move him out of center. The Yankees are doing the opposite. They're taking a guy who hasn't been a center fielder and putting him there as their primary plan. But they're doing that with a guy who's hurt a lot of the time. So, Again, breaking some of my rules here, I'm going to show you, or at least list out loud, some of Aaron Judge's stats for his career. In 2017, he played 155 games. Fantastic! The next year, he only managed to get in 112. That means he missed 50 games, right? Yeah, 50 out of 162 minus 112, that's 50. The next year, he played in 102 that's 60 games he missed. The next year, he played in only 28 of 60 games. It was the COVID year, 2020. Not even half. But it's worse than that. I've pointed this out many times, dating back to then. He was injured that whole time when all those games for the first half of the year or so were canceled due to COVID. He would have missed 
a ton of time. That's three straight years where he missed a lot of time. He came back in 2021 and played 148 games. That's good. Then he had his magical year, 2022, when he played in 157 games. And then last year, due to a fluke injury, I know, he ran into a wall that didn't move in Dodger Stadium. He played in only 106 games. But this is a guy who doesn't have a great track record of being on the field in one, two, three, four of his seasons, he's missed significant time. In my opinion, you don't take a player like that and put him in a place that's going to be more physically demanding. Now, some people argue with me and they say center field's not more physically demanding. That just makes a big question mark pop up above my head. It's not? Of course it is. The center fielder runs more. It's a more physically demanding position. It is. No one's ever questioned that. It's always been what it is. But sometimes it seems to me people are so intent on saying that whatever the Yankees do is right and saying, I can't criticize them. They're, they're, they're the Yankees. That they try to create false narratives, things that just aren't true. Center field is an athletic position. It's one of the most athletic positions. The center fielder has to run to balls in the gap between left and center, in the gap between right and center, back up the right fielder, back up the left fielder, back up second base on throws when there's a steal, etc. The center fielder's running more. And Aaron Judge, good or bad, fluke injuries or not, is a player that gets hurt a lot. And when he gets hurt, he misses a lot of time. But I didn't just say that he's going to be an injury risk in center. I said I'm afraid or concerned that he's going to wear down. If he wears down. Or if he gets injured, if playing center field is demanding on his body and his production suffers or he misses time because of injury, the Yankees are up the creek. I just don't see it as a smart plan. And the fact that he's beat up in spring training in March so much so that he's basically missed about a week leaves me with even deeper concerns without Aaron judge and without Garrett Cole, the Yankees, I don't believe are a championship club. I believe they could have acted proactively in December or January or February and brought in Cody Bellinger to sort of mediate having to put Judge in center to give them another quality baseball player, a guy who's younger than Judge. I think he's only 28 now. And again, brought in another high quality starting pitcher, Corbin Burns or Yamamoto or Blake Snell or Jordan Montgomery or Dylan Cease or whomever. And they didn't do either thing. And they've left themselves with very little room for error. And we've talked about this as well. If the Yankees don't win in 2024, I think the window closes once and for all. Glaber Torres is a free agent. I believe Clay Holmes is a free agent. Juan Soto is a free agent. Aaron Judge, Garrett Cole, DJ LeMahieu, John Carlos Stanton, Anthony Rizzo. I mean, that's really the core of the great players on the Yankees will all be that much older. And you just can't expect older players to stay healthy. Guess what? They're not. And be as productive as they were years ago. This was the year to go all in. Let's hope they know what they're doing. And let's hope it doesn't matter. But we saw DJ LeMahieu on Saturday foul a ball off his foot. Went for an MR, uh, an X-ray, I guess, and there are no breaks. But again, DJ's going to be the Yankees' third baseman. DJ hasn't had a good year for a couple of years because DJ's been hurt on and off. 
when DJ doesn't play third base, who's the Yankee backup third baseman? That's right. No one knows. I don't know. He's on third. The Yankees are living the who's on first routine in real life. But even worse, who's the Yankee backup first baseman? Yeah, DJ LeMahieu. So whenever Anthony Rizzo can't play, the answer is DJ to play first, leaving third base wide open. Is that going to be Oswaldo Cabrera? He hasn't proven he can hit in the major leagues. That's your backup third baseman? It's a little scary. So I am concerned. They don't really have that backup infielder. I don't think Anthony Volpe is an injury risk. I don't think Glaber Torres is an injury risk. But goodness gracious, if the Yankees lose either of those guys, then they're really up the creek. So I'm still optimistic. You look at the players, Carlos Rodon, Nestor Cortez, Marcus Stroman, Clark Schmidt, all pretty good pitchers. Austin Wells seems to be really coming around as a catcher. Anthony Rizzo seems to have bounced back from his concussion. Glaber Torres is entering his prime, and he's one of the best hitting second basemen in the league. Anthony Volpe won the gold glove last year, and he should improve. Alex Verdugo should be fine in left field. If he's healthy, Aaron Judge should be great. Juan Soto will be great. So there's a lot of good there. There's a, a lot of talent. It's just that once you get past that talent, there's not a lot, a lot behind it. And that's the big concern. All right. So I asked this question. This will be the Tuesday discussion on Start Spreading the News this Tuesday. Every Tuesday, I put a question out to the writers, and I just ask them to respond to a question. Sometimes it's about history. Sometimes it's about your favorite book or baseball movie. Sometimes it's about all sorts of things. Usually it's somewhat topical, but in light of the judge injury and the Garrett Cole injury, I'm asking, like, as of this moment, are either of those players Hall of Famers? So let's take a look. Garrett Cole has a Cy Young. He's won the ERA title two, two times. He's been an All-Star six times. He's led the league in ERA once. No, twice, 2019 and 2023. He's led the league in games started three times. He's led the league in shutouts once. He's led the league in innings pitched once. He's led the league in strikeouts two times. He's led the league in ERA plus two times. He came in fourth in the Cy Young voting in 2015. Fifth in the Cy Young voting in 2018, second in the Cy Young voting in 2019, fourth in 2020, second in 2021, ninth in 2022, and he won it in 2023. So it's a lot of good numbers there. He has won 145 games. He's lost only 75. His winning percentage for his career is 659. He has a lifetime ERA of 3.17. He struck out over 2,000 batters, 2,152. So those are some nice numbers. He's pitched 11 years. Except for the COVID year, he's made at least 30 starts every year from 2017 to today. This year, obviously, he won't. But he's been a big-time pitcher for a long time. Does those numbers, do those numbers... Does that make someone a Hall of Famer? So if you look down on Baseball Reference, there's a page where it compares each player to the most similar other players. These are the most similar pitchers at this point in their career to Garrett Cole. Johan Santana, a very, very, very good pitcher. 
not a Hall of Famer. David Price had a higher peak, I believe, but he couldn't sustain it. Cliff Lee was a very good pitcher. Oh, my goodness. There was a time when it looked like he was this close to being a Yankee. And I was so excited. I always wanted Cliff Lee to be a Yankee. Chris Sale, very good pitcher, injured a lot. Steven Strasburg, very good pitcher, injured a lot. Then there's a Hall of Famer, Dizzy Dean, Jared Weaver, Jim Maloney, who is an underrated pitcher, Sal Magley, who was, I love doing this because you see these guys, you go, oh, wow, isn't that interesting? Sal Magley, one of the few guys who ever played for the Yankees, the Brooklyn Dodgers, and the New York Giants. He might be the only one. And Roy Oswalt. So, mm, doesn't look good at this point. It seems like he's a little short. You could give the old Dizzy Dean argument. Dizzy had a short career. He didn't have a long career long career he had a you know great peak he got hurt and was never the same again but i think if it ended right now and let's hope it doesn't let's hope he has many 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 good years ahead of him i would have to say that as of this moment garrett cole is not a hall of famer i think he would get some votes i think he'd get some some support but i don't think at this point people would be able to say Garrett Cole is a Hall of Fame pitcher. Hmm. All right. So what about Aaron Judge? There's a lot of Hall of Fame support for a different Yankee right fielder who played in the same decade in which I was born, but I was born at the end of the decade and he was being a star in the beginning of the decade. He won back-to-back -back MVP awards. He also set the American League record for home runs in a single season, breaking Babe Ruth's record. That's, of course, Roger Maris. Every year when people talk about players who deserve to be in the Hall of Fame, people bring up Roger Maris. Well, Judge has one MVP award, Maris had two, but they both have a big home run season setting a record that stood for decades as a Yankee right fielder, which is irrelevant. And you could argue that Judge deserved the MVP the year that they, they gave it to Jose Altuve. So let's look at Judge's numbers over his career. Judge led the league in runs in 2017 and again in 2022. He led the league in homers in 2017 and again in 2022. Led the league in ribbies in 2022. Led the league in walks in 2017 and 2022. Led the league in on-base percentage and slugging percentage and on-base percentage all in 2022. He's hit 257 homers. He's driven in 572 runs. He was the runner-up to the MVP in 2017 when he won the Rookie of the Year Award, was 12th in MVP balloting in 2018, 4th in MVP balloting in 2021. He won it in 2022, and last year he was 15th. Other awards of note, he, as I said, he was the Rookie of the Year, home run champ, five-time All-Star, three-time Silver Slugger Award, and he was the Major League Player of the Year in 2022. So let's see who he compares most to. I love this. The player he compares the most to at this moment, Juan Soto. Well, Juan Soto's on a Hall of Fame track, but he's not there yet. The second player, this is interesting, Matt Olson. The third player is even more uh, interesting, Kyle Schwarber. Then Ronald Acuna Jr. Jonas Cespedes. Cody Bellinger, who I wanted the Yankees to get. Bob Horner, who when he came up, a lot of people said he was going to be the next great home run hitter. Kevin Mitchell. Josh Hamilton. And Chris Davis, but it's K-H-R-I-S Davis, not the Chris Davis who played first base for the Orioles. 
Right now, today, Aaron Judge has accumulated, let's see his war numbers here, uh, 35.5, no, 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 more than that, 41.5 war. Usually 60 is the borderline number, so he's well below that. He'd need two 10 war seasons to get there. If he has two more 10 war seasons, I think he's a Hall of Famer. Is Aaron Judge a Hall of Famer right now if his career, God forbid, ended? No, unfortunately, he's not. That's a shame. But it gives us a lot to look forward to. Interesting. I think a lot of people, when they see these guys, they think they're Hall of Famers right now. Unfortunately, for Garrett Cole and Aaron Judge, they've got a bit more to go. All right, so let's look at these strat cards. This is kind of fun. This is will only take a minute on this. But I want to talk about fielding and the importance of fielding. And we'll revisit Aaron Judge playing center field in light of a board game. It's in light of a board game. So we're not going to take this overly seriously, though Stratomatic has a reputation for being the most realistic board game that replicates how players do. It's been lauded for its statistical accuracy, statistical accuracy for decades. The game came out in the 1960s. It stood the test of time. And so, you know, when you see the rankings, you say, huh, okay. They base it on statistics. Anyway, let's Anthony Rizzo. The best fielders at a position get graded as a one. The worst get graded as a five. Now, they do have cards for certain players in certain sets that take into account their whole career or their prime years or things like that. But for these cards that I'm sharing with you, this is just based on their season last year, the 2023 year. The year ends, they spend the winter making the new cards, and in February or so, the new cards come out, which replicate how the players did based upon their statistics from the year before. So let's just ask the question, and you can play at home. Would Anthony Rizzo be one, the best fielder for fielding type first baseman in the league? Two, a very good fielder. Three, an average fielder. Four, slightly below or five, atrocious. Stratomatic says he's a two. I think that's a very good number. And I think that's pretty accurate. I don't think you can make him a one because he missed so much time. Glaber Torres. Where would you rank him? One, two, three, four, or five. Stratomatic says for his range, he's a three. And that sounds about right. He makes some great plays, but he misses routine plays. Average, right? Yeah, I think so. Anthony Volpe, the gold glove winner, is a two. Again, I don't think you would see Anthony Anthony Volpe and say, look at his defense. He gets everything like Ozzie Smith would or a shortstop like that, but he got to most everything. So I think a two is pretty accurate. DJ LeMayhew, always known as a fine fielder, at third base would be a two. At first base would be a two. Interesting, at second base, he's a three. Maybe he lost a step over there. One of the problems with the Yankees last year was a lot of their outfielders didn't do very well playing outfield. Like Jake Bowers, if you put him in left field, he's a four. John Carlos Stanton, if you put him in the outfield, in left field or right field, is a five. So those are kind of fun. I love playing Stratomatic when I have the opportunities. And I love when the new cards come looking at the cards. But we talked a little about Aaron Judge and playing center field. 
And if life were a game of Stratomatic, it's not. This is just a game. I don't want people to put in the comments, you're talking about a game. It's not real. Okay, I understand that. That's why I keep saying it. But it is a game that's known for its statistical accuracy. In right field, Aaron Judge is a one. You can't get any better than being a one. When you play the game, if you look on the defensive charts, an outfielder who's a one catches balls that a two, a three, a four, and a five won't catch. That's why they're rated a one, because they have the most range of anybody in that position. In center field, he's a three. So he's not bad. But he's not a very good center fielder. He's not an above average center fielder. So here's my thought. If I was playing Stratomatic and I had the choice, Aaron Judge would play right field for me. It's not even a question. With that card, he would catch balls and make more outs than the typical right fielder. There would be fewer hits in front of Aaron Judge or over Aaron Judge's head because he covers so much ground in the game. But in center field, he's going to let a lot more hits get by him. That means the pitchers are going to have to work that much harder. I know it's a game. They're not really working, but to translate it to a real game, of real baseball with live people. I mean, I think both of those suppositions are things that seem like they could be true and would be true. He is a better right fielder than a center fielder. He'll catch more balls playing his typical position than the position he doesn't typically play. And because he'll miss more balls in center field, the real-life pitchers are going to have to work harder because more balls are going to fall in, which then means more runs are going to be scored. But take it one more step. You have a guy in the game. Again, it's just a game. But in the game, you have a guy who will catch every ball hit to right field on the one chart because he's a one and you can't be better. No one can catch more balls than him. And you're going to take that away and put someone else there who's going to let more hits fall in. And you're going to move your one to center field where he's going to be a three where more hits will come in. See, I think this is one of the points people aren't understanding about moving, and it takes a game to actually make the real-life point. You're putting a guy in center, and I've said before, who might wear down, who might break down, who doesn't have a great injury history. You're going to put him in center and hope for the best. But he's one of the guys you can least afford to have break down or wear down or get injured. But in doing so, you're taking away a great right fielder, replacing him with a less great right fielder in Juan Soto, and hurting yourself not just in right field, but in center field as well. And I don't have the Cody Bellinger card because I only bought the Yankees, but I suspect Cody Bellinger is not a three. He might be, but I suspect he's not. If you have the card, you could write in in the comments and say, oh, no, no. Cody Bellinger is a different number, but I have a sense he's a two or a one. Now, I think Trent Grisham, I don't have his card from last year because I only have the Yankees. Maybe I should get the Padres cards. I'm sure he's a one or a two in center field. So when he plays, the Yankees will be okay in center, and then Judge can go to right. Maybe. Maybe they put Judge in left, but he's never played left field. This is where 
where I just don't think the Yankees think these things through, right? Like, oh, we'll put Judge in left, but Alex Verdugo's in left. So we'll put Judge in right, but Juan Soto's in right. Well, then we'll DH Juan Soto. I guess that makes sense, but then what do you do with John Carlos Stanton? If it was me, Juan Soto would have been in left field. Cody Bellinger would have been in center field and judge would stay right where he's the best, right where he's comfortable, right where he knows what he's doing. There's no learning curve. He's a great right fielder. Anybody else the Yankees put in right field is going to be a step backwards. So that's something. I writ, I writ, my goodness. I wrote a article the other day and I'm starting a series of articles where I'm destroying myths about the Yankees. I encourage you to go to start spreading the news and type in the word myth in the search bar. I wrote an article the other day about the myth that Yankee fans won't put up with a rebuild. That Yankee fans only go to the games when the Yankees are championship quality or when they win championships. And I destroyed that myth by giving the Yankee attendance records over many years. So let me see if I can pull that article up real fast. Let's see if we can get this to come up. The Yankee myth busting. Um, Let's see if I can get that here or if I have to really dig deep here. I think I'm going to have to dig a little deeper. It's going to take me one more second. I have to go to the archived articles. But I want to share this with you because I find this to be something that's very important. A lot of times people make these stories about the Yankees and they're just not true. They're simply not true at all. They say, oh, the Yankee fans, the reason the Yankees can't build a great team is the fans won't put up with a rebuild and things like this. So I called the article Ending Yankee Myths, number one, weather, fair weather fans only, basically. Well, here are the Yankees since 1996, their rank, or since 95, their rank in attendance. 95, they were 14th. 96, 11th. 97, 10th. 98, 8th. 99, 4th. 2000, 7th. That was the championship year. They weren't ranking at the top of attendance. But then 2001 comes, 3rd second the next year, and then first, 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 first. That was for the years that they closed the old Yankee Stadium. 2003 through 2008, they were first in attendance in the major leagues every single year. Yankees weren't winning World Series every single year then, but they were a very, very good team. In 2009, they had a new stadium. They were second in attendance. They won the World Series. The next year, they were first. And then watch this. Second, second, fourth, third, fourth, sixth, sixth, second, third. Then the COVID year, which wasn't applicable. Eighth. And the last two years, they've been third. This is a fan base that supports their team. Now, are they going as often when the Yankees aren't winning World Series? Like in 2013, 14, 15, and 16, they weren't great, but they were fourth, third, fourth, and sixth. And then in 2017 was when a lot of the rookies, Gary Sanchez, Aaron Judge, and all that kind of stuff, they come up, they, they're still sixth. The next year, they were second. People say the Yankee fans don't support the team except if they win World Series, but it's provably wrong. It's absolutely wrong wrong. It's a myth that des de deserves to be destroyed. And I'm glad to say that I destroyed it. Yankee fans are loyal fans. Yankee fans did support a rebuild. 2013, 14, 15, 16, 17. They weren't going to the playoffs most of those years. And they were pretty darn bad most of those years. Granted, they were better than the worst teams, but they weren't really contenders. There were a lot of also-ran guys on those teams. A lot of has-beens. 
Lyle Overbay, Vernon Wells, Travis Hafner, Kevin Euclid. I mean, those are the names I remember from that era. Jacoby Ellsbury and all of that. Like, no, those were not great teams. And yet the fans came out and supported them. Coming soon, I'm going to destroy the myth that the Yankees only became great in the 1990s because George Steinbrenner was suspended in the beginning of that decade. Because that is absolutely, positively a myth. I'm going to destroy that myth by making a list of all of the Yankees who came aboard either through the minor leagues or through trades or free agent signings that became Yankees only after George Steinbrenner returned to the team from his suspension. There's this myth that, oh my goodness, Steinbrenner just traded away all these kids. He made gr- crazy trades. He would just make the worst trades ever. He f- he operated by the seat of his pants. He didn't listen to the baseball people and he destroyed the franchise. Except none of that's true. Some of that might have been true in the 1980s when a lot of Yankee prospects were traded away. Jay Buhner, Willie McGee, Doug Drabeck, Fred McGriff. But I always push back on the Fred McGriff, and I've written this article numerous times. If you type in Fred McGriff in the search engine and start spreading the news, you'll find the article. The Yankees traded Fred McGriff when he was in single A baseball. He was steps and steps and steps and steps away and years away. I believe he was traded in 1982. He didn't become an impact player, I don't believe, until like 1987. And it was only after he started to become a big-time home run hitter that people go, wait a minute, didn't the Yankees trade him? But then again, the Yankees weren't the only team that traded Fred McGriff. Look at Fred McGriff's statistics and list all the teams Fred McGriff played for. Even when he was great, even when he was an impact player in the major leagues, teams were trading Fred McGriff. But we're going to say the Yankees did a terrible job because they traded Fred McGriff when he was in single A ball. It's just silly. That's a silly one. But if you want to make the argument that Steinbrenner did get rid of good Yankee young talent in the 1980s, and then the Yankees fell apart, which they did at the end of the decade, and in the early 1990s, they were terrible. If you want to say that's because of Steinbrenner's decision-making, that's an argument you can make. And maybe we'll examine that someday. But if you want to argue that the Yankees of the 1990s were built while Steinbrenner was on suspension, it's just an absolute falsehood. It's provably false, and I will do that very soon on Start Spreading the News by listing the guys who came to the Yankees after Steinbrenner returned. And that includes guys like Derek Jeter, Mariano Rivera, Jorge Posada, Andy Pettit, And other young players, Shane Spencer, Ricky Lede, Ramiro Mendoza, all guys who contributed greatly to the Yankees championship years. People then say, but he wanted to. Steinbrenner was going to trade them. Okay, maybe. Those all seem to be revisionist stories anyway, but okay, maybe. It was this guy that saved Jeter. It was that guy that saved Pettit. It was this guy that saved Posada. Okay, maybe they did. But the fact that a guy might trade somebody else is irrelevant. Do you know why? Because he didn't. Derek Jeter didn't get traded away. Jorge Posada didn't get traded away. Mariano Rivera didn't get traded away. I'm sure that if you sat down around the table for every Major League Baseball team 
and had the general manager and the big time players who make personnel decisions, the uh, director of personnel, the team presidents, the team owners, and all of that, and they talk about players, I'm sure they throw all sorts of things out on the table. In fact, the story is that Ted Williams and Joe DiMaggio were once traded for each other. And then the next morning, the two owners said, whoa, we can't make that deal. That's crazy talk. But the fact that teams behind closed doors talk about trades among the people who make decisions, that's not a earth-shattering thing. That's exactly what has to happen. In fact, if they don't talk about trades, I would think something's wrong. The Yankees right now should have been talking about trading Anthony Volpe and trading Spencer Jones. I'm not saying they should have traded them, though I think an argument could be made because, as I say, the window's closing and this is the year to do it. Not necessarily Volpe because he's now the shortstop, but Spencer Jones, maybe. He's years away. But anyway, those conversations should be happening. They should always be happening. What could we get for Aaron Judge even? Doesn't mean you're going to trade him. It means you're thinking about what these players are worth. You're having important discussions among the people who make those discussions. So George Steinbrenner might have almost kind of traded Derek Jeter for Felix Fermin, but he didn't. So it means nothing. And then you look at the guys Steinbrenner brought in who became Yankees only after Steinbrenner came back from suspension. There's no championship core without those guys. There's no core four. They all came up after he came back. This is a myth that's easily proven wrong, and I can't wait to finish that article and publish it. I'm sure some people go, yes, but Tino Martinez wouldn't have been a Yankee. He came after Steinbrenner came back. I mean, (laughs) where do we go down the list? David Cohn, David Wells, Roger Clemens, Charlie Hayes, Daryl Strawberry, Derek Jeter. Mariano Duncan, Chuck Knobloch, Joe Girardi, on and on and on. They all came after Steinbrenner came back. He didn't destroy the team. He was the guy running the team when all those guys came in. You can't say the Yankees win in the 1990s without Steinbrenner. Yeah, a couple of guys preceded him. Jimmy Key, Wade Boggs. Paul O'Neill, Bernie Williams. But the rest of the guys, they came after Steinbrenner came back. That'll be the next myth I destroy. All right. So I guess we're just about at the end of our hour together. There's other things I want to do. There's other things I always want to do, but there's just never enough time, which is a good thing. If you haven't yet gotten 365.2, please go out, get the book. I think you're going to love it. It's very revealing. It's basically a diary of my 2022 life as I ran every day, sharing some of the circumstances of my life as to show you that when things happen in life, if you have goals and you have a focus, you can put those things on the side sometimes. Sometimes that's necessary in order to reach your goals. The least among them, award-winning book about the 29 Yankees who played uh, for the team on only for only one game. I mean, what else is there to say about Roy White's autobiography? One of the classiest, greatest Yankees of all time. He belongs in Monument Park and the Yankees right now. Right this minute should be working to make sure that happens. My wonderful novel, this will make you laugh. It'll make you cry. It might make you pray. It's a story of family, love, faith, baseball, marathons. Also award-winning. Roy White's book, also award-winning. All these books have won awards. Remember, 
the Start Spreading the News program is brought to you by Artemisia Publishing. Go check out all the great books that they have. They've been doing this. A traditional publisher, an independent publisher, traditional publisher, doing this for over 20 years, setting some of the highest quality books and highest quality work in the industry. Go to apbooks.net. Once again, my friends, thank you for watching. I will be back live next Monday with EJ. Hope you had a good hour with me. I enjoyed sharing baseball talk with you.